I'm so glad you're with us. Joy to the world in this season, in every season, but especially at Christmas time. Joy to the world. I got my special guest with me, Miss Pam. <laughs> so good to have you, sweetie. Exactly. We're going to get to talk about joy to the world. And don't we just love Christmas? I do, because people are singing, talking, explaining, declaring joy. And you know, at this time in life, at this time in history, I know a lot of you, you're not feeling the joy, but you're listening to the right message. Joy to the world, not because I said so, but because the King of all kings, God of eternity, is announcing, pronouncing this over your life, over your family, over your future, joy to the world. So let's welcome the Holy Spirit to truly help us download this message from heaven. Father God, we just thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that you sent and that Jesus has authorized to work in our life. And right now, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to unfold God's mysterious truth and show us the way in this season to have joy here on earth, joy for eternity. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to get a hold of God's word and our lives will never be the same in Jesus' precious name. Joy to the world. This is actually part three of a series called Joy to the World, but I really believe in and of itself, this is going to stand and bring hope to your heart, and you're going to get some joy from Jesus because that's what Christmas is all about. One of the things that we've learned from God's Word about joy and the true Christmas story is this, you cannot fake the bake. Isn't that good, right? That's a new version. Pam, you can't fake the bake. What's that mean? It means that you can't substitute real ingredients. Let's say for a chocolate chip cookie, you can't substitute for the chocolate chips and end up thinking you're going to have chocolate chip cookies because all the kids are going to go, hey, man, where's the chocolate chips? Where's the chocolate chips? Right, yeah. right. You cannot substitute the authentic good news of the gospel of Jesus. You cannot substitute what God has provided when the angels gave the big message to the shepherds. Good news of great joy. You can't substitute those ingredients and think you'll end up with authentic joy. No, no, no. The angels said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy. That's the true light for true joy. You know, Advent, this is a season where we celebrate Advent. Advent is traditionally celebrated by lighting a candle. But in reality, Jesus is the true light, not just for one but for the whole world, the true light that shines in the darkness, that shines in the hopelessness and brings the reality of authentic God-born hope. Right now, we live in a bad news world. Pam, I don't know if you heard, kind of heard this, but I mean, there's a lot of bad news going on. I turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Look, the, let's be honest. The media makes money off of bad news. The world is making a cake, so to speak, that nobody wants, but yet everybody's eating it. You see, we just keep dysfunctionally tuning in to see who's getting hurt, who's sick, who's tragically dying on this bad news cake. It's awful. But God has the bread of life for you, my friend. It's what everyone wants, everyone craves, everyone deep down desires, but yet too few are eating God's bread of life. Why is that? Well, it's because deception abounds in this dark, distracted reality. We need the Christmas light turned on, turned on full, shining bright and singing loud. Good news. Pam, that makes me think of that, that movie Elf, right? Yes. Right. How do, you, how do you spread Christmas cheer? But singing loud for all to hear. <laughs> well, instead of listening to Mr. Elf, let's hear what the angel of the, of the Lord has announced to us. Once again, Pam, would you do the honors and read to us Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. In the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord flashed and shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. Oh, my goodness. Terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For this day in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. 
the Savior. Look, when you're not used to good news, Pam, or a good news messenger, you're always going to have this fearful, timid response to good news. It's just, it's kind of natural. Living in this, this sin-filled, dark world, it's kind of natural that when God springs on us, good news, people go, oh, oh I, I, don't, I don't think I want that. I think I... I think I need to stay home. I think I need to back up here. You see, when you're used to the dark, when, when, when you're used to things being compressed and dark and shut down, the light can be intimidating. The shepherds weren't just nervous or a little bit afraid. The Bible says, what's it say, Pam? They were what? Terribly afraid. Terribly frightened. Sometimes you need fear cast out of you to get the good news of great joy put in you. I'll say it again. Sometimes you got to get the fear and the nasty stuff, the bad news out of you to make room for the good stuff, the good news and the light of Jesus on your on the inside of you and your heart. The truth is sometimes in life we really don't know what it is we really want or need. You see, we become so familiar with our darkness, our hurts, our lack, our dysphoria, that we, we tend to embrace them almost as an identity. When you embrace a wrong idea, you automatically fear or resist a good idea, a God idea. That means we may think this is this. We may think this or we may think this is what will make me happy. But God knows better. God knows the ingredients of what will really authentically, genuinely give you joy. He's got the good news ingredients of that great joy that we've come to know as Christmas. Look, in this segment of joy to the world. Pam and I, we want to talk to you about the art of sharing joy, of how to bring joy to others, how to give joy. Pam, do you remember you and I, we were, we, we were actually engaged, and I remember it was Christmas time, and we had this great idea. I think you came up with it. Hey, let's take your grandparents out, go to Niagara on the Lake, and take them on a horse and um, carriage. Buggy. Yeah, horse carriage. And, yeah horse and buggy carriage ride through the, the city. It's a beautiful little town and that this would be really Christmassy because, you know, Grant grew up with horses and all that kind of stuff. And so we thought this would be wonderful. So on our way down, it was actually in a snowstorm, Christmas Eve. It's dark. Pam and I are driving them down. We got them in the back seat. It's supposed to be a surprise. And as we're driving down, we just get into the town and there's other people driving around in their horse and carriage. And my grandmother, she looks out the window and she goes, oh my goodness. Look at those silly people out in the freezing cold in this kind of weather riding in a horse and buggy. She goes, that's just foolishness. And Pam, like, she's kind of beside me. She's kind of like reaching over and tapping me. She goes, oh, she goes, Pam's like, oh, no, this is going to be awful. But you know what? We pushed on through. I started laughing and I said, well, well Nan, guess what? You're going to be one of those silly people out in a buggy driving around. She goes, no, I'm not. And I said, yes, you're my grandfather's laughing and we knew they were going to have these, they had these bearskin rugs that yeah, we could pull over nice us. It was warm. very warm. It ended up being such an awesome memory. Now that my grandparents are gone to heaven, I cherish that memory. It's just so wonderful and beautiful. They loved it. They did. Yeah, they but we really had to press on. Yeah. Sometimes in bringing good things to people, parents, you know this, you got to push on through because sometimes people don't realize what it is they really want. The truth is, all of us, it happens to all of us. Sometimes we really don't know what it is we want until we're truly being led. You see, shepherds lead. The Bible calls Jesus the good shepherd, and he is able to lead us through life. He's able to lead us even into the desires that we don't even understand that will be wonderful memories and beautiful things in our life. We don't always know in reality what it is we want. When we're seeing in the dark, we tend to see things, everything skewed and upside down. Jesus is the expert giver, but he still needs a receiver. I need to still receive what Jesus has for me. And you and I, we can only get what we're willing to receive. The Christmas message is all about giving us that shining star that we can find our way, that life compass so that we can make it through the obstacles and the trials and the difficulties of life. But do you know where you're going in life? Can you really answer the big question? Well, the question is, it goes on. What have you received? Tell me what you have received because, you see, you cannot give what you have not received. How can you ever give joy if you haven't truly received Christ's joy. When you leave 
this mortal life. Let me ask you this. Do you know where you're going beyond this mortal life? You can. You can have an assurance. You can have a peace and a knowing that God's plan is already put in place for your life, for your eternity. Isn't that good news? The number one fear of humanity is the fear of dying. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the kind of, it's so hard to share joy from your life when you're full of fear. Your joy gets a, it would be like kind of doing a bake and having garlic in the bowl before and then trying to bake something sweet and it still tastes like garlic, right? You, you just, it's hard to give joy when you've got fear contaminating your life. Jesus came to completely deliver you and me from that fear and all fear. He's the good, good shepherd. He really is. You know, the Christmas story has a star in it. We know the star, but not everybody follows the star. You know, that's a, the star is God's compass. That's good. You know, that's good. the Bible specifically says that it was wise men, wise men who pursued the star. They pursued God's direction. That says a lot. And, you know, God sent messengers to those working in the fields at night. They were shepherds. They, they cared about people, but the, they're also angelic messengers came. And it says in the word, in the Amplified, it was a heavenly knighthood. I love that. Shouting glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill for all men. And gave directions on how to get to the King of Kings. Pam, we need, that's so good, we need direction on how to get to the King of Kings. It doesn't happen naturally. It needs to be a supernatural occurrence. Because look, um, even the Colossians says, even the angels and devils didn't know what God's plan was, how mysterious and beautiful it was. They didn't understand it, comprehend it. We need a compass. I like the way you put that. A compass, a North Star, to get to the good news. Do you have a star to guide you, my friend? People with a GPS, they know the way. Do you have a supernatural GPS? Do you have that guidance system to Jesus' joy? God is always faithful to supply the way for those seeking direction. Now, it's interesting. There was a man that seemed like he wanted direction. His name was King Herod. And in Matthew 2, that's another part of the Christmas story. We know that the wise men, they actually intersected with King Herod. And he acted like he was pursuing Jesus. But listen to this. Not because he was interested in worshiping Jesus or getting life direction for himself. See, he had his own perverted agenda. The truth is, King Herod wanted to murder Jesus. He was jealous of this little baby who was going to be called the King of Kings. He was busy building his own kingdom of worshipers, and he didn't want any competition from Jesus. I like what Roy L. Smith, the Christian author, said. He said, he who has not Christmas in his heart will never find it under a tree. Let's put it this way. Presence under the tree will never put his presence, God's presence, in your heart. Never. Christmas is about being led because you can't be truly joy-filled until you're led. You got to be led, my friend. It's interesting that it's impossible to receive God's love, His blessing, His help without humility, without humbling ourselves and saying, God, I need your leading. I need your direction. You've got to get off the throne of your own heart. Stop being your own king and let the real king reign from inside you. The wise men got to worship baby Jesus. Why? Because they were willing to receive direction. Pam, you said it so well. They were willing to receive direction. Wise men sought direction from the star. The shepherds, they got the joy from baby Jesus. Why? Because they submitted to the angel's words. You, there's got to be some direction in your life, some submission. Um, a famous writer, Wilda English, she wrote this. So beautiful. God grant you the light in Christmas, which is faith, the warmth of Christmas, which is love, the radiance of Christmas, which is purity, the righteousness of Christmas, which is justice, the belief in Christmas, which is truth, the all of Christmas, which is Christ. I would add to her prayer, Pam. I would add to it this. 
God grant you the good news of Christmas, which is great joy. You see, until you receive the good news, you can't have the great joy. That's, that's a Bible truth. Until you receive the good news, really receive it in your heart. There's no way for God to get the great joy into your heart. That means you're empty, and empty people see everything in life upside down, twisted. They easily twist every experience because of their empty condition. Instead of looking to God, they do like what C.S. Lewis did, and they blame God for everything that goes wrong. In his younger years, it drove him to be such an angry atheist for a season until he received the reality of God's truth. God loves you, my dear friend. God loves you so much. Your disappointments, your sorrows are not God's design. You've been misled to think that God is somehow a failed savior because you've been wounded in this life. God needs access to your heart. The Bible says that Jesus knocks on the door of your heart asking for entrance. Not demanding it, but asking for entrance into your heart. You alone have the delegated spiritual authority over your life, over your heart. God can predestine only to the extent that you choose His plan, His love, His intervention, His salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but the fact is, and you know this to be true, many do perish. C.S. Lewis said this, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become the sons of God. Isn't that beautiful? Pam, God and man. Yeah, absolutely. Pam, I can invite you to the party. Put your name on the table setting. Save your place. Put a gift or two under the tree, which you know I have to do, right? Yes. <laughs> and I can even have your favorite Christmas songs playing in the playlist. You see, I've predestined Pam and her presence at the party, but she still has to choose the gifts, the joy, whatever I've provided for. She has to choose to receive them. God sets a table for you, my dear friend, but you still have to take in the joy. Good news has come, but you still have to receive it. Why do you assume that because someone fails that God failed? Why would you assume that because someone dies that God never set the table somewhere? Why do we assume that because bad things happen, that God never provided good things as an option? Could it be easier and less pressure on our thinking and believing to just somehow blame God for whatever's wrong? God is good all of the time, every time, any time. That's part of His character. His mercy is everlasting. It's new every morning. It's baked right into his character. How's that for a segue? It's baked right into his character. Speaking of baking, Pam. <laughs> That's right. God's mercies are new every morning, and I am so thankful for that. I've got Amanda with me today, Amanda Buffum. She's an amazing baker. Oh, my goodness. She makes amazing things. Amanda, what are you going to uh, bake for us today? We are going to make peppermint brownies. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite Christmas recipes. It's really easy. There's not a lot of ingredients and they're flourless too. So they're naturally gluten free. That's me. I'm probably I'm a lot of you too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a healthier recipe, but super tasty. So to begin, we will start with the almond butter. We'll throw that in the big dish here. I do you kind of get? I the, love almond butter. Do you kind of get the 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 no stir almond butter, so it's a little bit more. Nope, I gotta stir it. Oh, you gotta stir it. Okay. Yep, it's a little bit of work, but it's worth it. So we throw in the almond butter, and then we have about a half a cup of maple syrup, which I'm a huge fan of maple syrup for a natural sweetener. Me too. Huge fan. And then we have. You can't forget the vanilla. The vanilla is one of the most important pieces, I is think. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. In cookies, brownies, pretty much everything. I love vanilla. So you have that. And then the peppermint. One, two, three, four. And then we'll do the eggs. Essentially just mix all of the ingredients. Try not to get any of the eggshell, but we all mess up sometimes. 
<laughs> then we're gonna mix that up. I like to do it by hand because it's kind of a smaller recipe. Perfect. Ooh, yes. Just a pinch, thank you, Pam. And then you can kind of see here, you got kind of like a caramel, caramel consistency. That makes you just wanna eat it right it's, there. It does. <laughs> which is what you want. And then you add the cocoa powder. Mm. It's about a third of a cup. Throw that right in there. And the chocolate chips. We're talking Very chocolate. Important. We're talking chocolate. All chocolate, mm -hmm. always chocolate. And then you mix that up. Then you got the brownie batter. Mm. And it looks really good. That looks really good. That looks really good. This is so nice because you know it's hard to find gluten-free recipes yeah. that are yummy. And this, this one's really I can tell yummy. it's gonna be yummy, so yeah. Awesome. There you have that. And then the final touches. So you put it on before and after. Yeah. Okay. If you really like peppermint like oh, I do. I do, yeah. Yeah. And then you put it in the oven, um, 350 degrees, about 18 to 20 minutes, and then this is what you should get. Wow. And Peppermint so then you brownies. put some more on top after it's cooked, right? Yeah, to make okay. it look pretty, yeah, just decorate it, it a little bit. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. They're I'm really good. Do you want to taste one? <laughs> mm. Oh, that is really good. Yeah? That's really good. Good. That's so good. I got this in my mouth, but <laughs> Amanda, yeah. there's a lot of people watching. Is there something that you would like to pray over them or declare over them for Christmas? Yeah, um, my Christmas prayer for you guys is just that you remember the real reason for the season. Um, it's all about um, the gift of the Lord and His birth and um, the gift of His salvation to us um, is really precious and the love He extends to us. So just to never forget that. And I pray that you feel His presence and his peace and his joy this season too. Yes. So. And our peppermint brownies. <laughs> <laughs> that too. That was just wonderful. These have been fun, this yeah, series. This I has did. been so fun. Yeah. So look, one of the ingredients to the Christmas story was the Christmas star. That was part of the whole story, right, Pam? You talked about the Christmas compass. I like how you put that. That's right. The wise men, they followed his star. You know, what, what star are you following? You need a star, the guiding light for your life. Yeah, I like that. It's um, not a, um, an astronomical thing or a mm -hmm. guiding light. It's not an ocular perception. That's right. Um, but it's a spiritual light, a spiritual compass that's guiding you through all the obstacles, through all the roadblocks, through all the valleys, through all the storms and the trials of life to victory, that's to joy. Great. That's good. That's what the Christmas story is all about. We were in darkness and God sent his light. His light. In Matthew 2, 10, it says, when they saw the star, they were thrilled with ecstatic joy. Oh, you got to read that again. <laughs> I got to hear that again. When they saw the star, when they saw the direction, they went, the star, the compass, the, the, the catalyst for answers, the catalyst for joy. When they saw the star, they were thrilled with ecstatic joy joy. Look, there is great joy. Yes, ecstatic joy. When you have the star, the, the spiritual GPS, the spiritual compass of life, when you have Christ's star, your compass, do you realize Jesus being the light is your compass? Can you imagine, Pam, opening a present on Christmas morning and inside is this beautiful, heavy vintage. You like vintage stuff. I know you do. Priceless compass. Like I'm going to even say it's set in gold. But instead of pointing to the north, it has this mysterious spiritual ability to point the way in every circumstance, in every relationship, every challenge, every need, every financial concern, every every concern of life, this thing points the way. The compass points the way to the unfailing light, the unfailing truth. Well, my dear friend, Jesus is that compass. He's that compass gift that God has given us. Jesus is the way, the Bible says, the truth and the life. And people throughout the centuries have received the gift 
But you know what they do that's, that's kind of an insult to God the giver? They often keep the gift hidden in their sock drawer. Or maybe they think, oh, this is so value, valuable. I just need to be religious about it and put it in a vault somewhere and not actually apply it to my life, but just keep it as some kind of holy grail that I worship one day out of the year. No. God wants us to activate, use, be practical about using the compass, the light, every day, 24 hours a day, in the middle of the night. If you wake up and you got fears and concerns and worries, to plug in your compass, get the compass, Christ, the light, glowing in your life, and receive direction. God does not want you without direction. I love for... Um, I think it's 2 John 2.20. It says that, that He has made all things known to us. That's what Christ has done for us. Made all things known, all things revealed. But you have to have the compass in your hand. You've got to have it in your heart. You've got to have it before your eyes. That's why God told the children of Israel, keep the Word of God before your eyes all the time. There is not a compass on earth that can help you if you just keep it in your pocket. Not even a natural compass. You can't, it can't not help you if you just keep it in your pocket. There's not a recipe in any kitchen, Pam, and I, and I keep telling you this, anywhere on earth that it won't work for you if you don't follow it and use it and apply it. How many times Pam has made this amazing recipe, and at the end it's just like, oh, Pam, that was so good. Don't ever forget that recipe. I tell her that because... You know what she does? She doesn't forget it. She puts it in a drawer somewhere, and then afterwards, she does what we call in, in the music business, she riffs. She just, you know, ah, you know, I did it. I, I made those biscuits once. Tell you what, you know, I'll just riff this time, and we'll just see what happens. And so then they come out, and they kind of look the same, but you bite into them, yeah, and then you realize you forgot maybe the baking soda or that little pinch of salt, yeah. and it's like, I, yeah, honey. Something's wrong. Thank you, but um, something's wrong in paradise. This is not so good. Not so good. So look, let, let Pam and I give you a recipe on how to share your own Christmas miracle with others. I believe God's got a Christmas miracle for you, but right now God wants you to posture to be able to share it with others. Let me give you five, just so you can put it all in your hand, five steps to a bake to bake a little bit of joy for someone else and in the process be blessed by spreading some joy. So the first thing you got to do, number one is first make sure your bowl is clean. I know that sounds like it's, it, it sounds logical and it sounds like, well, I just took for granted the bowl should be clean. But you know, the truth is a lot of times our hearts, we, we want to invite God's joy in, but in, in our hearts are all kinds of nasty things that we really need removed from our heart first. That's the very first step. Make sure that your bowl is clean. Before you mix anything in, you've got to make sure that you've cleaned the bowl. It's like a spiritual principle. You don't want to start making cookies if there's dog hair or cat hair in your bowl. You don't want to start mixing joy if there's anger, resentment, or unforgiveness in your bowl. Right? You, you got to get it out. You got to get the cat hair out of your bowl. So how do you do that? <laughs> you ask Jesus to come in and you say, Lord, I'm just laying down all my fear, all my worries, my angers down at the foot of the cross. You got to remember what the angel said. The angel said, fear not. Right? Isn't that what the angel said? The, yes. Before he even said, I got good news of great joy, he told the disciples, fear not. I, I got to get the, the hair out of your bowl. Isn't that what he said? Sort of? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pam, what's Psalm 37 verse 1 say? It says, fret not because of evildoers. Lucky. And you had to really help me with this recently. I was like, but this is, you know, and sometimes it's just so easy. It seems like, Lord, do you know what's going on around? But this is what he said, fret not because of evildoers. Okay, so... First thing you got to do is you got to clean that bowl. There you go. You got your nice bowl clean. So there's point one. Number two, now that your bowl is clean, right, you got to put some good news in your bowl. So let's get some good news going on here. Yep. Oh, look at that. Good news. I got good news. If you're going to make a joy cake, you've got to have good news and you got to have lots of it. Right. That's one of the things in this recipe. You got to have lots of 
good news. Because good news, this is what the angel said, it's the primary ingredient to great joy. You got to have the good news in your life, in your heart. You got, and you got, you do it. You got to receive it. You got to receive the good news so that you can share it. Remember, the angel of the Lord said, I bring you good news of great joy. Good news is the foundational ingredient. You need to know how to counter the bad news that some people live in with the appropriate good news. For example, if somebody's struggling in their health, you should be armed with some good news that says, well, you know, the Bible says that by Jesus stripes, you were healed. If somebody's struggling, let's say they lost their job, you should be armed with some Philippians 4 verse 19 that says that, well, you know, the Bible says that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. God's got this for you. God's going to lead you. You know, you should be able to tell people who just feel like they're without direction. Maybe somebody's in a relationship and they're just struggling and they're being tormented. You should be able to give them some good news that says, you know what? Jesus is the good shepherd and he says that his sheep hear his voice. Listen to his voice and he'll direct you. He's a relationship expert. But you got to be filled with the good news so you can give the good news. And that's a primary ingredient. So first, your bowl's clean and then you just start lacing it with good news, lots of good news. Then number three, now you got to put in a cup of, and this is so good, a little bit of do good unto others. Pam, this is what we're supposed to do. Psalm 37 verse three says, do good, do good to, oh man, like this do good is uh -oh. sticky good news. It's, <laughs> it's so good. It's, it's chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's sticky good news. So you got to do good to others. Look at that. Get some do good to others in your bowl. I'm just going to keep my, my left hand there in the bowl. You got to do good unto others. Pam, the other day you took some soup to a precious older woman. You did her good. And I mean, it wasn't like the soup cost a lot, even though, you know, I know you made it from scratch. You boiled the turkey bones all night. You put your heart and soul into it. But man, it was such a blessing to her. It just brought tears to her eyes and made her feel loved. You know, I remember you were praying because there were some things going on in my life that I felt like, God... I'm, I'm anxious, I'm getting fretting because it, it seems like, you know, justice and things isn't happening or different things that were going on in my life. And you said, let's follow the scriptures. You said, you know, fret not, trust in the Lord and do good. Do good. And so, you know, that day I aggressively, I just went at it with like, this is my job today to, to find someone that I can do good and, and listen to God. How can I do good today? And it was such a joy to me too. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, this isn't just for adults. You know, when I was a boy, I mean, I, I would take the opportunity to shovel driveways for older people in the winter, mow lawns in the summer for widows and, and help people do good. Add the ingredient, add that wonderful chocolatey ingredient of doing good. You know, just sprinkle it in there, do some good. That's a part of having this great joy and being a carrier of that great joy. And then fourth, now this is a big deal. Now, Pam, one of the things that you have to add, and this is really important, is a pinch of flexible persistence. Flexible persistence. This is a real big deal to your joy bake, to your joy cookies, your joy cake. I mean, this is what makes it perfect, tastes fresh. Have you ever had someone bake cake or cookies and leave out that pinch of salt like what we were talking about? It just, it has a funky taste. There's something wrong. Like you just, something's wrong in paradise, right? You can't put your finger on it, but it's weird. Something is wrong in cookie land. So have you ever had somebody give you what seems like a gift or a blessing and it really becomes more about them? Mm -hmm. It's really them kind of putting the pressure on you, them kind of exercising control over you. You know, the truth is I've had people in my life that they've done that to me and it feels bad. I mean, even as a little boy, I mean, there was times when I had an authority figure in my life who would do that to me, seem like he was giving me a gift when it was really a measure of a way of controlling me and manipulating me. And so then you become scarred in life. You, you, you get some kind of wrong thought on gifts. And, and you know, there was times when I would resist gifts from Heavenly Father because I thought it would come with the same strings, mm -hmm. the same control methodology. Well, look, Philippians 4 verse 5 says this, let your gentleness be made known unto all men. Just a little gentle pinch. This is how you do it. 
Look, mothers are amazing at this, Pam. They do their children good even when their children don't want good. Sometimes you have to build that trust before people will truly receive the joy that you're serving. Pam, quote for us again, Galatians 6, verse 9, because this is like one of your life scriptures, one of your favorite scriptures, and it just, I feel like it just hits the nail right on the head when it comes to this whole um, flexible persistence. It says, don't be weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. So good, so good. So clean bowl, right? You got to add, then you got to add the good news. Then you got to add some doing good to others. Then fourth ingredient, that pinch of flexible persistence. And then finally, last but not least, you got to give. You mix it all up. You apply the heat. You bring it out, your finished product, and you've got to give. Look, if you've got the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, it's called joy. Then, my friend, you cannot help but give. When you've got that joy in your life, you become an agent of joy. You give joy. It's just like if you've got hurts in your life and if you've got unhealed um, traumas in your life, you become an agent of those hurts and you carry those hurts to other people. But when you've got Jesus' joy on the inside of you, His light, you become an agent of that joy and of that light. Giving is an outcome of our character and most reflects the character of God the Father. God so loved that He gave. Your bowl must contain a, a generous helping of giving, giving, give to others, give. Jesus is the one that said, He said, like, give of your kindness, give to those less fortunate. He said, you know, we can even give to our mentors and give to our advisors, give light in the dark, give hope to the hopeless, give a phone call, give a text, give a visit, a card, a pair of socks, but give your best gift. Give, whether it's like Pam, like a cup of soup, a, a, a whole big tub of soup for a widow, or give of your resources, give forgiveness at Christmas time, forgive somebody. It can look like giving honor, giving praise, giving encouragement, sincere compliments, giving attention, giving a listening ear. you got to take your bowl that you've mixed together and you've got to be activated and give. Phillips Brooks said this, the author and minister, he said, Jesus Christ, the condescension of divinity and the exaltation of humanity. Simply put, that means God came down to lift you up. Jesus came to promote us out of being children of darkness to being children of light. That proclamation from the Son of God gives us that Christmas suddenly appeared. Remember what it said? And suddenly appeared that kind of expectancy. The Christmas that you can receive the gift, this guiding star that Pam was talking about, the compass of life, who is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and you can be saved. Pastor Stephen, how do I do that? Well, look, the good news for Christmas miracle is right now, right in this second. Pray this prayer after me. Invite Christ into that secret place of your heart. You can empty out your bowl, all your pain right now, and just invite Jesus to fill your heart, fill your life with his love, his peace, and his joy. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, you came to earth as a child, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that I could be adopted into the family of God. You lived a life without sin. You died on a cross for me in my place. You rose up from the grave. Forgive me of all my sins, Jesus. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life, the guiding light of my life. Show me true north so I can honor you. Fill me with your joy now. All in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen he sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. 
Remember Jesus is Lord and in Him we can live life strong.